Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News Desk. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Lemle. We are on channel 124 on Go TV and channel 125 on DSTV. Around the globe, we're at myjoinline.com and you can catch us live via DTT. Coming up this morning on Joy News Desk, journalists working with the Bone Radio in the Northern Region attacked during a live show by a former NDC constituency Deputy Communications Director. We have all the details for you shortly. Also this morning is the era of artificial intelligence, otherwise known as AI. What do you know about its evolution and its potential benefits? risk of society. Stay with us. We find answers with engineers and tech experts. And in our labor series, we shine the spotlight on Rashid Dababa and Madina who grooms the hair of some of the top musicians on the continent. It's very tight, especially with the video. Whenever he's in the plane, he gives me a call like Rashid. At this time, we should be at this hotel, Bel Air Crest. I meet him and we just have a haircut. We have details plus business coming up shortly. My name is Aishi Brian. Do stay for details. Radio show host with Dagbon Radio, Sadiq Abubakar Gerba, has been attacked while hosting a live show. Former NDC Constituency Deputy Communications Director Hadi Pagaza stormed the studio and disrupted the program. Mr. Pagaza is captured by studio cameras holding the broadcaster by the neck and attempting to drag him out. So, Karnera. First, I'm going to come Handala. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> 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 Well, uh, Northern Region correspondent Martina Bugri has joined us with more on this. Martina, what was the discussion on radio about and what really transpired during the attack? listen to the tape, um, there was discussing something that has to do with the fire service um, when Mr. Hardy and his counterpart walked in. When they walked in, um, what he asked the host was, what have I done to you? And then somebody in the background tries to stop Mr. Hardy. He says, director, it's okay. Then the host asks, what's he going to do? And he says that, what do you mean, what am I going to do? So the other guy takes on the conversation and he says, Take, stop talking about him. If you want to die, stop talking about him. And so the conversation goes with, if you want to be, um, if you don't want to die, stop mentioning his name. 
stop mentioning his name. And so it's basically he should stop discussing Mr. Hardy. That's all the conversation is about. And so they come, it goes back and forth, and then they drag each other out, almost out of the studio, and then the host comes back. Now, what we are being told is that um, it didn't start yesterday, um, that Mr. Hardy Pagaza had made some comments on the Dabon chieftaincy dispute, and that the host had put it on show and a discussion was held on it. He had made some comments on the consequences that comment could have on the current peace the area was enjoying. On a different show, we are told Mr. Hadi Pagaza had uh, rebutted. And then, so yesterday's show, when Mr. Sadiq began the show, he said he wasn't going to comment on what Mr. Hadi had said on a different show because he wasn't credible. That was the basics. And so he says that whilst they were having the show, they walked in and attacked him. Uh, thankfully, uh, Sadiq Garba, who is uh, the journalist in the studio, has also joined us. Uh, Sadiq, uh, good to have you. What were you saying that must have provoked Mr. Pagaza uh, to actually storm into your studio to attack you? Yeah, I, uh, before I started the show, I played the tip in which he mentioned me in a sister station. So I said, no, this guy is not worth commenting on. I will not comment on his tape because he, he, he seemed not to be credible. So such people, I don't want to discuss them on my show. That was just it. And I dropped the, uh, the, the tape and we moved it, uh, on to our other topics that we, we, we plan discussing. So I was discussing with my panel. All of a sudden, I saw them move into the studio. Uh, immediately they came, they came straight to me to, to do the attack. How did this happen? Don't you have security at your premises? Yes, there's security. And after the incident, I started finding out from the security why he allowed them in. And he, according to him, uh, he moved to the washroom. And when he saw them, he thought because the guy has always come to the studio for programs. So he thought uh, yesterday was one of those days, only for him to realize that he has moved in to do something different. Has the matter been reported to the police? Yes, even we are currently at the police station. And what is the police saying? The police said he invited him, so they are waiting for him to come. All right. Thank you very much, Sadi Garba. We'll be monitoring and bring you more on this as it unfolds. Meanwhile, on the occasion of World Press Freedom Day marked yesterday, British High Commissioner to Ghana, Harriet Thompson, challenged journalists to always do proper and thorough research before coming out with uh, their report. Issues affecting the well-being of journalists dominated discussions as the world celebrated that day. Speaking on PM Express, the British High Commissioner Harriet Thompson said there is too much misinformation in the system and must be checked. Continuing to talk about those issues that are troubling, um, that are troubling journalists, uh, ensuring that the government really understands what it's like day to day for any journalist to get out and do their job, uh, the challenges that they face. I think that um, there is a risk, I'm a civil servant myself, there's a risk that civil servants sort of talk about things that we haven't experienced, so those, those relationships uh, between the different sides, the different actors in this space are absolutely crucial so that each understands the other's perspective and is able to move forward together. It's so important to have journalists who are bold and committed enough to keep going until they've uncovered the story, till they've really got to the bottom of what's going on. I would um, urge them to do a proper thorough job. There's too much misinformation and disinformation out there at the moment. And really effective journalism needs to be alive to that. The UK is going to be offering some training in that space to journalists. We've done some, we'll do a bit more. Um, because there's a risk that well-respected 
um, journalists who are committed to that moral code, committed to ethical reporting, are being misled by some of that information that's out there at the moment. So it's about being alive to the risk, it's about being bold, being committed, and knowing who to turn to when something happens that, that makes you feel intimidated, makes you feel like you're being restricted from doing your job. You have the British High Commissioner Harriet Thompson and definitely on that issue regarding the attack on a journalist in Tamale, we'll, we'll be speaking with uh, Mr. Pagaza who attacked the journalist. He's, uh, he's promised us that he will be speaking with us after his engagement with the police. So we'll be bringing you that. Uh, but this morning, let's also talk about the era of technology, where technology is being extensively exploited to carry out certain human functions and attributes to make life better. The deployment of machines or apps to speak or act like humans, otherwise known as artificial intelligence, is not gaining traction for the positivity, but also for the abuse and danger it poses to individuals, business, and security systems at large. So how much do you know about artificial intelligence and its impact on you? I'm joined in the studio right now by our own spiking chroma how are you I'm good, I'm good to see you good, good. Too. what new gadgets have you released oh it's always <laughs> just say there's nothing new yet because when it comes you will have yeah, it. yeah as always <laughs> so let's talk about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. first let's look at its evolution right the history of artificial intelligence so you know when people talk about ai we think it just started a few days or weeks or months yes, ago, exactly. maybe last year, because of the advent of ChatGPT. Yep. And that's when artificial intelligence really came to the fore. But in truth, it dates as far back as 1950. That's, you know, uh, the history of artificial intelligence started when researchers began exploring the idea of creating machines that could think and do stuff like humans. So based on that, a lot of research has gone in, it has evolved over time. We've made mistakes, we've improved, we've decided on what's to change and how to make it even better. And guess what? Now we're at a, a, a phase or a stage where it's gotten closer and closer to humans. Hmm. Let, let me also bring on uh, Abigail Otiko Amate, who is an uh, artificial intelligence engineer. She would also help us understand the history of AI and how it is it has evolved over the time, the current state of AI research and development and the potential benefits and risk uh, AI has for the society as well as the role of AI in business and industry. Welcome, um, Abigail, on board. And first, as I welcome you, let me ask you, what's the current state of AI research and development? Uh, did developers anticipate uh, what we're seeing right now? Hello, Abigail. All right, if Abigail is not on, we'll try and get her. Abigail, can you unmute for me? Do we have Abigail? All right, so whilst we try to yes, fix her line. Me? All right, so we can hear you, Abigail. Go ahead. Okay. Please come again with your question. I, I'm just asking you to tell me about um, the state of AI research and development as we, we speak and whether the developers anticipated the results we're seeing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think right now there's, there's a fear and there's a scare that people think AI is replacing jobs. Of course, AI is going to replace 87 million jobs, as of now, that I know. But it's going to also replace and bring about 97 million jobs, if you could hear me. But people are scared that it's going to take up their job, but it's going to replace it with more jobs. But for you to be able to reach up to that tax, you have to equip yourself. You have to upgrade to get to that stage. Because gone were those days that some of the work we were doing are currently outdated and we are no longer doing that now because of technology. So I think there shouldn't be that fear and panic 
when people think AI is going to replace job, indeed it's going to be replaced, but we also have to learn. Unlearn, I mean unlearn to relearn new things. Because these robotics and those things coming, it's human beings that are going to manage them. So I think so, yeah. You know, why shouldn't we panic and, and spike it? Because I saw a video of a child learning to walk where there's a robot that has been created for that job. So parents don't ha have to bother themselves helping their work, but it's the robot that's supposed to be holding the child and doing the steps with them. The risk, however, is when um, the child missed one step so, I mean, I don't know if you followed that news, but the child had her finger mm -hmm. cut off because it's, you know, all, all those issues. So, um, why shouldn't we panic? W what are the potential benefits and definitely the risk associated with AI? So, um, let me backtrack a bit to the, the example you gave about the, the robots. So, robots have not reached a level of um, autonomy powered by AI so mm -hmm. far. They are right now, a lot of robots are programmed and they are automated. So they are following a set, um, a set of rules. Yep. Say, do this, do that, do this. Mm -hmm. But artificial intelligence is essentially taking a human intelligence, which is our ability to learn and think and adapt and using that to improve. So if that robot was powered by artificial intelligence, what it would do is that it would learn, it would predict the possibility of that child falling mm -hmm. and avert it. Okay. But because the, product, the, the robot is just programmed to just do you know, A, B, B and C, C, it did not anticipate, it did not learn, it did not adapt, could miss her and just, you know, just continued on with what yeah. it was programmed to mm -hmm. do which is what you find in factories. So yep. factory robots, all, all they know is that I've been programmed at this point. This, this is this, what I must that. do. Exactly. I don't have to think. So the benefits of AI is that adaptability, that ability to learn and you know, correct itself or to know, hey, this didn't go as planned. Or imagine you're walking. Every day you're coming to work, you use this route. Mm -hmm. And then on a certain day, you get there and there's construction on that route, so you have to divert. Mm -hmm. If it was a, a, a robot, robot that was just programmed to yeah. use that route, mm -hmm. it wouldn't know that, hey, I need to turn right oh, here because it will just go straight into because that ditch. Because that's how it's been because programmed that's how it's to work. Programmed. Yeah. But the benefits of artificial intelligence is its ability to perceive that you know, change, mm -hmm. its ability to adapt and change. And then we go back to the risk. And that's where the risk comes in. <laughs> where Abigail was trying to yeah. say people shouldn't panic. Right now, if machines can perform what human beings mm. can perform and probably faster, why shouldn't companies uh, um, take them instead of employing human beings? I, well, I would side with the companies take <laughs> because I believe in productivity and efficiency. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that's going to cause us to move forward in, yep. you know, in life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of technology has come and we've feared change all the time. I'm sure in the, the advent of, with the advent of electricity, people complained, the co-workers were complaining, our jobs are going to be come for because they were powering the steam engines, they were powering every other thing, but now there's electricity. And electricity, mind you, also had its risks. Yep. If you touch 200 volts or above, you could die. Yep. But at the same time, without it, you wouldn't be hearing me right now. Mm -hmm. We have, you probably have a microwave oven in your house that used to yeah. be your food every day. That Definitely. same microwave technology could harm people. Mm -hmm. But then again, we use it for good. Mm -hmm. So with every new technology, it comes with its risks. But as it develops, people, we learn from it. We learn, okay, this is where the risks are. This is how we can adverse the risks. Yeah. This is how we can regulate it. Mm -hmm. And before long, it becomes a part of us. I honestly believe that the benefits far outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. And the more we focus on the benefits, the more, the easier it would be for us to, you know, circumvent all these risks and avert them. And I believe we become a, a people that are capable of improving, you know, better than previously. Mm -hmm. Then we didn't have the knowledge we have now. And yep. mind you, artificial intelligence is also giving us more knowledge, mm -hmm. things that we couldn't do before. Um, yeah. In medicine, for instance, cancer cells are being identified faster. MRI scans are being processed faster with the yep. help of artificial intelligence. Yep. Mm. So... Yeah. But, but the, the bit about um, what Abigail, the point she made that, yes, um, we shouldn't panic because it's not like artificial intelligence would um, take our jobs from us. But what we actually need to do is to improve and upgrade. That means that we need to actually upgrade to the level of 
uh, a robot that has been programmed with a, an artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. that means you have to actually start acting like a, like a machine, like Max Weber <laughs> wants you to work. That's impossible. I mean, no, you're human not, not going to get there. What he was trying to say essentially is that we need to learn mm -hmm. more. So certain jobs are going to become obsolete. I was just talking to someone about a month ago about a, a job opening and I said, well, I don't want that job because it's going to be obsolete in three years. Mm. In three years, a lot of companies are going to be replacing that role mm. with and an artificial intelligence out of system. Job. And I'll be out of job. Okay. What I want to do is learn how to program that system that is going to be doing the job with mm. the knowledge that I have. Okay. You know, so if you have the skill and you know that your skill could be replaced by an AI, say maybe you are... A broadcaster, yep. and maybe we've got into a stage where AI can pr present the news, ask the questions, and mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. It would be in your best interest to understand how the AI works, so you could train that AI okay. to do the job. Mm -hmm. Because the the AIs need training. Yep. They're like kids. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are kids at this point, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're going very fast, okay. and they need people who are going to hold their hands and guide them through the ropes. You can't expect an AI to know um, that this is journalistically right mm -hmm. or this is uh, wrong. Yeah. It knows only what it's been fed. Yeah. So your job now is, okay, if somebody asks you this question, it would make sense to say this rather than that. Okay. It would make sense to address them this way rather than that. Do not do this, do not do that. Mm -hmm. So you train that AI to do that. And those are the jobs that Abigail was mentioning are going to be available you know, for people, for those who think that their jobs are, okay, it's rather going to make your job easier. Mm. Wouldn't you rather be at home and all you have to do is just, okay, so I'm about to interview Spikey. Um, AI, what questions should I ask Spikey? And it's listed for you. Okay, okay. how would you ask him? Okay. Tell me. Mm. And then the AI starts reciting and say, okay, no, don't, don't say it don't this way. Ask say us. it this way. Okay. Then you ask it again. How would you respond if Spikey says this? Mm. No, this is wrong. Say it this way. Next thing you know, yeah, that's the whole interview for you. You're sitting at home and you get paid your salary. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not that simple, though. <laughs> but Abigail, I, I want us to look at the role of AI in business and industry. Hello, Abigail. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. I think with the role of AI, I think... A lot of females are, are scared to move into this area. Um, I don't know what the fear is about. We have just few ladies, even though right now there are a lot of opportunities for ladies to move into AI, but I think the fear is there. And I think there are more um, sensitization going on there for more ladies to join. And I think right now I'm on a course which is called Microsoft Power App. It also uses AI and machine learning which uses lesser code. So with, with this one, you don't need to even code much. It uses lesser code to do a lot of things like chatbot and all that you can do. So that is it. And I'm just using this as a channel to push more ladies into AI for me. Let's talk more about the, the role of AI in industry and uh, business. Uh, you've spoken about how, I mean, productivity will be enhanced. What, what else? Would AI do to our business? So yesterday I was on Masterclass talking about artificial intelligence, and mm. one of such examples that I was giving mm. was data entry. So you know how constantly companies need to be entering data, and we know how important data is to businesses. Yep. I mean, data, as we've reiterated more than enough, is the new gold. Because yeah. the more data you have, the more you're able to make predictions, the more you're able to save on costs and certain expenses and losses. and losses. So if you are able to process data, which humans can't do as much, yep. let's take for instance, um, you and I, okay. we can fall sick. Today I have a problem with my foot. Mm -hmm. It would take me longer to get to point A mm -hmm. or point B because mm -hmm. of my foot. Yeah. An AI system is not going to wake up tomorrow and say, I'm sick. Yeah, I'm sick. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to wake up today and say my, my spouse upset me and as a result, I it's come to work my and it's job. affecting my productivity. <laughs> the AI is not going to feel that way. It has okay. no emotion whatsoever. Yep. So you have the benefit of systems that are always on, mm -hmm. faster, yep. would also churn out, would be able to process data absolutely, incredibly, fault, fault, uh, uh, faultless, faultlessly, or without, flawlessly. flawlessly, without mm -hmm. 
a very with a very little margin of error. Error. And then you also have cust customer service, mm. where AI. I'm sure by now you've probably spoken to so many chatbots without even knowing it, yep. because they speak so much like human mm -hmm. beings that you think that you're actually talking to a, to human. a human being. Now back again to the human who's been upset by their partner or their spouse in the house, <laughs> comes to work very upset, is working in a call center, and somebody calls, my data is finished, and then the, the call center <laughs> person just loses <laughs> their temper and uh, blasts this person. Uh, 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 Next thing you know, that person just takes out the SIM card and chooses it and says, you know, I'm not going to subscribe to this network Definitely, again. Definitely, and then, that yeah, is a loss for the company. That's a loss for the company. Mm. Imagine that that person answers 100 calls. Yep. You've lost 100 customers. Yep. No AI is going to do that, mm. right? Mm. So you have all that benefits, and you have... I, I keep talking about efficiency. Efficiency is really very important in the future of everything that we do because... Mm. We're not, nothing is um, infinite in this world. Everything is finite, yeah. and time especially. But and looking at the, the era in which we are, the cyberspace, mm -hmm. we're looking at cybercrime, and we said that cybercrime doesn't need any structure mm -hmm. or anything. Somebody can be in their bedroom and just uh, commit any crime. Right. I mean, what risk does this, because if this thing can speak like a human being, then... Um, I receive the call and says, okay, you're speaking with the uh, secretary to uh, Joe Biden and blah, 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 and I transact business yeah. with them. Yeah. I mean, this that's dangerous. True. This is a very huge risk, and it's something that I, comp I continue to talk about, um, awareness and education, because in every crime, people are victims because they probably didn't know you know, better. Yeah. And AI, as you mentioned, the risk here is the fact that people can simulate people's voices and faces. I could take your face and make you say anything. I could take your voice and just type. And these, these tools are readily available today. Yeah. I can take text and just type and you, you'd say it in your voice. Mm -hmm. I've seen a movie that was done with AI. You had um, President Joe Biden's voice in yeah. there, you had Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. you had um, Obama's voice in there, all these ones were synthesized. You've even seen imagine. music being produced <laughs> where Drake and Weekend quote unquote made a song in and it was by AI. Interesting. And it sounded very real. So yes, people can perpetrate crime with AI. Yeah. But the only way to avert this crime is with education and awareness. Mm -hmm. Because if you are none the wiser, trust me, you would fall for it. Yeah. I could even fall for it. Oh, How much yes. more the lay person? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. And so, Abigail, um, what do we need to do to safeguard um, the, uh, I mean, surroundings or the system? Because we agree that the benefits are enormous, but we're not ruling out the risk that faces us. Uh, how do we go about this? All right, I think that Abigail has a problem with her connection, but I think Spikey has made the point. He says that we should, education, education is the key. We should create awareness. We should all be aware of what um, is around yes, us. As we around embrace us. the technology, we should also see that it comes with challenges and we must try as much to avoid being victims of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Spike Spikey Nkrumah is a tech consultant, Abigail, um, Otiko Amati is an AI engineer. They joined us for this conversation. Let's move on to other stories. He has crafted a niche for himself and is now regarded as one of the best in the industry. We are talking about Rashid Moro, a barber based in Medina, who is the go-to hair grooming person for some of the A-list celebrities on the African continent. As part of our series to celebrate hardworking Ghanaians all over in our labor series, Kukwa Sante shines the spotlight on Rashid Dababa. For many men, three weeks is too long a time not to see a barber. This has led to a boom in that industry in Ghana with many young people learning that trade. This story is similar for Rashid Moro, who knew right from senior high school that this is what he wanted to do. After school, I had some mentorship outside the country, in America and UK. So I decided to like give up everything, give up the school and just follow my hustle because yeah, that's what my heart is with. And I'm happy when I'm making people happy, making people fresh, and they're also happy with me as well. So I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with the work I do. It has paid off 
and he has no regrets. Sometimes I have, sometimes I can have a, a regret more, but my mentorship, they, they motivate me more. Yeah, I have, I have mentorship like Taylor Cat. He motivates me more to like love the work, put in my heart. And after putting in, I've received more from the work. So I'll encourage anybody to come into this work, learn it, and you will enjoy it very well. For some of the most prominent musicians on the continent, Rashid is their go-to Baba. From Berna Boy to Shatawale to Davido, the list is endless. So I, I see on your wall Shatawale, Davido, Berna Boy. These are high-ranking celebrities. How did you get to be their Baba? Mm, you know, I do, I do, I do good work. I respect, and I also love people. And with these people, they connect me to people, and they also connect me to people. And it gets me to them by God's grace, you know. Yeah. So I see some of them. You've you've babbled them only sometimes twice, sometimes thrice. It means they go, they come back. Okay. Yeah. So it means they really appreciate the work you are doing. How do you sense the relationship with them so far? Mm, the relationship is very tight, especially with the video. Whenever he's in the plane, he gives me a call. Like Rashid, at this time we should be at this hotel, Bel Air Crest. I meet him and we just have a haircut. Rashid hopes to expand and employ even more people. For Rashid, having the best of working relationship with his staff is paramount and his staff members are excited to contribute to the growth of the hair grooming shop. In the next few years, I see myself very far. I see myself like flying in and out to give other players haircuts. I see myself like outside. It's very big, trust me, it's very big. Yeah. Uh, last one, I see that you, you employ other people, you teach other people, you actually have another shop outside of this place. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, my guys are very good. They are, they are very, very good as, as me. They are, they are doing their best. You know, I love them. Yeah, without them, I can't, I can't do everything. They are, they are with me always. Yeah, they are loyal, like they are faithful. Yeah, and it's keeping them going as well. We are all inside. He's been like a brother to me. I've been with him for the past six to seven years now. Yeah, so we had great experience together. And with him, at least I've gotten so many opportunities to able to explore more in this time. So I guess he's been a great colleague to me. And he's done a lot of things. We've all been looking up to him to get to where we all hope to be. So I'm just hoping one day to be so this is all Rashid has always wanted to do. He went to the same senior high school, Benkum Senior High School, Latte Kuyapem. And back then, he said he wanted to make this big. Some of them believed the dream that he had and knew that he was going to expand this to bigger frontiers. In there, you see pictures of him barbering top celebrities like Davido, Shatawale, and Bernard Boy. These are A-rated celebrities on the continent. And whenever they are in Ghana, their first port of call is Rashid. And he says he's looking forward to expanding this business to even bigger frontiers, to be able to achieve some set of goals. He now runs two shops here in Medina. He employs more than six people and is looking forward to opening this business even bigger and better. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Medina, Accra. The British High Commissioner to Ghana, Harriet Thompson, says the UK is very much interested in helping Ghana to secure an IMF bailout. Harriet Thompson says the UK has been working closely with the Paris Club to consider cancelling the debt of Ghana to facilitate the country's efforts in getting an IMF bailout. The lack of clear assurance from the Paris Club over Ghana's external debt restructuring program a stumbling block to assessing a three billion loan from the IMF. We'll hear from the British High Commission shortly, but first listen to Ghana's Deputy Minister for Finance, Dr. John Kuma, who says he cannot give timelines but only expresses confidence that Ghana will get clearance from the Paris Club for the bailout. Ghana is very hopeful. Um, the Minister for Finance just returned from the Springboard meeting in the US. Uh, he took opportunity to meet our bilateral partners and multilateral partners, I can say that we are very, very hopeful that uh, we will secure the Paris Club uh, financing assurances within the shortest possible time. I'm unable to give timelines, but I can assure you 
Discussions are going very, very well. And very, very soon, Ghana will hear the good news. Well, the British High Commissioner to Ghana, Harriet Thompson, says the UK is doing all within its means, including talks with China to help Ghana secure the bailout. We've been urging them to move faster. We've been engaging closely with Ghana throughout the process and also encouraging countries outside of the Paris Club, like China, the obvious one, but others besides Turkey, India, for example, are also important mm. creditors to get on board because it's only by coming up with a joint solution that we'll be able to, to move forward. This is one of the outstanding issues uh, waiting to, to, be, to be resolved before the IMF board can approve that program. Mm. But right now, you agree with me that China is our biggest hurdle to cross to be able to get to where we want to be. What's the role of the UK in actually getting China to accept our offer? So China certainly is key, certainly is key. They account for about 33% of sovereign debt, that's government to government debt, which is not actually uh, at the same level of around the world who've been over undergoing economic uh, crises, economic challenges. Um, but they are, of course, an important player. So the UK has been engaging, as has, China, as has Ghana, we've seen very publicly. The UK has been encouraging them to, to come to the table, mm. to take part in these discussions. And I'm really pleased that it looks like that is now happening. They are engaging positively. Mm. Uh, and we are hopeful, as is Ghana's government, of, of speedy progress. The Baptist Medical Center in the Northeast region recorded 16 deaths of pattern babies due to the absence of a neonatal intensive care unit. According to hospital management, neonatal deaths related to prematurity at the facility rose to 16 out of about 100 cases recorded last year. The hospital is also facing a shortage of specialists such as pediatricians and medical doctors. Consequently, the management has called for support for the construction of a neonatal intensive care unit to address the rising rate of preterm deaths out of the facility. The Baptist Medical Center, Nalirgo, considered as the Northeast Regional Hospital, is faced with several challenges that are hindering the provision of adequate medical services. The facility recalls an average of 80,000 and 100,000 outpatients and over 18,000 inpatients a year. Being a major referral facility, the hospital serves a large area of the five northern regions and some patients come from northern Togo and eastern Burkina Faso as well. Among the numerous challenges facing the hospital is a lack of a neonatal intensive care unit to provide special care for premature newborn infants. Dr. Isabella Aisha is the medical director of the facility. She says the absence of a well-equipped neonatal intensive care unit is affecting the management of neonatal cases. From January to October 2022, we have seen 590 cases that need neonatal intensive care. And then out of those cases, we had about 138 cases of prematurity. And out of the 138 cases, too, we lost 16 of them. Some of them, or most of them, arrived needing resuscitation and died in the process of resuscitation. They didn't continue on for long. Some came with bad sepsis. They had been kept away from the hospital for a while. And so they came with associated problems and died. For more than 60 years, neonatal intensive care services at the facility have been ineffective as all neonatal cases were managed with the mothers on the maternity ward due to the absence of a specialist and inadequate accommodation spaces. In a bid to address the challenge, the hospital management in November 2021, and with the support of Hamsley Charity Trust and UNICEF, designated this mini structure as the neonatal intensive care unit. Aside from the inadequate accommodation spaces for the patients, the facility operates with six incubators and six courts without monitors. According to Dr. Isabella, these equipment are woefully inadequate compared to the number of cases being received at the unit. You can imagine the stress on the six courts and the six incubators that we have. 
Um, the space is just so inadequate for our nursing staff. It's inadequate for mothers. We don't even have a place where mothers will um, rest awaiting the next feed. There's, we still have a very long way to go in the area of expansion of our neonatal intensive care unit in the provision of um, resting places for the mothers. The medical director also expressed worry about the absence of a pediatrician and other specialists as well as the shortage of medical doctors at the facility. I would like to, not just for pediatric doctors to come, but any specialty. Would, uh, the hospital is a beautiful hospital. We are located in a region that is that has good potential to become better than it is right now. So um, I, I really do not see what the hitches are in my colleagues and senior colleagues to join us to provide services for our people out here. So if they can join us, um, I welcome them to join them and I challenge them to do so. On his part, however, the hospital administrator is calling for support for the construction and equipping of a new neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, what we are praying for and we are seeking the others to support us is to help us to more or less get fun to put, we have a land, let's put a new unit, complete unit for the military intensive care so that we can be able to provide all the necessary equipment, necessary uh, divisions and then also get some plans for the mothers to stay and to sleep. The two traditional chiefs of Jimbali, whose rivalry led to the outbreak of intertribal armed conflict between Konkombas and Bimobas in the Upper East region, in the Upper West region, have uh, pledged their support to uh, sustain the peace of the area. We'll bring you that report shortly. But right now, let's move to Nalerigu, where the lives of peoples and teachers at the basic primary school in the East Mampushi municipality of the Northeast region are under serious threat as academic work is conducted in an old dilapidated building with visible cracks with parts of the structure ripped off. In addition to the bad state of the building, inadequate teaching and learning materials, including furniture, negatively affect teaching and learning as pupils are compelled to lie on their bellies on the bare floor to study. Some parents and members of the school's management committee say several appeals to local authority to fix the problem have yielded no positive result. They are calling on the education ministry and the local government and rural development ministry to intervene. Far, one may be tempted to think this is an abandoned and unoccupied structure. It is, however, a classroom block for peoples of the Nalirgu ME Primary School, located at Nalirgu, the capital town of the Northeast region. Constructed in 1952 with stones, this is the second oldest school in the region after Zobzia Primary School in Gambaga. The structure, after years of neglect, has become so dilapidated with deep cracks and patchy roofing materials loosely hanging waiting for just an opportunity to crumble. Part of it has even begun to break down, an indication of how weak it has become and dangerous to occupy. Yet the authorities continue to keep school children in this structure, pretending to be educating them under such dehumanizing conditions as you are about to see. When the school began operations in 1953, the classes were structured from class 1 to 6 and from there to middle school. Today, due to the deterioration of the building, the classes are reduced to just P1 and 2 inside the class rooms, a cemented floor has long given way to a bare sandy floor with no single decks. The peoples are forced to sit or lie on their bellies on the dirty sanded floor to take their lessons. It was lesson time when we visited and here in class one. As you can see, this is how the school children sit to take the lessons. This is just a floor uh, with nothing very dirty floor, I must say. Coupled with a leaking roofing and inadequate ventilation, the people said the building was not conducive for teaching and learning activities. As a reflection of the kind of education being provided in this school, the peoples were unable to express themselves in English, so we managed to interact with them in the native Mampuri dialect. It's Abu Walatif. So why are you sitting? We have no desks to sit on, so our uniforms are always dirty. 
because we sit on the ground. We need a new school building. In class 2, the majority of the children were seated on stones and rocks erected inside the classroom in place of furniture for learning. Others sat on mat while the remaining were seen utilizing the bare floor to write. We are afraid the building could collapse on us. We need eggs and a new According to the teachers here, some parents have come to express their fears about the state of the school block, with some of them warning to take action against the school if their children's safety were jeopardized. They say the dilapidated condition of the school has over the years affected academic performance as well as people's enrollment. In an interview with a parent, he described the classrooms as a death trap while appealing to the municipal assembly authorities to act immediately to prevent a calamity. We look at the situation as we are even standing, see the stones and other things. Some, they are on a mat. How do they study? How can they study? Even with all the best books and other things, materials around, how are they going to make it? Are they going to put their books on the stones to write? Look, most of them have their books on the floor. Are they going to lie on their stomachs and be writing? How is it going to look like? Mm. This is just a, a death trap. We have all seen it. Every moment from now, it at what can happen. We are going into the rains. You see that cracks, those cracks there, is very dangerous. Mm. Any reptiles may also even make it their habit. They can be there. Who knows? So it's dangerous. As for that, we don't, we don't feel comfortable at all. Seeing the situation is very bad. So I think right now is now on the government or the assembly to do something about it. The poor state of the school building has been a source of worry for many opinion leaders and other stakeholders in Nalergu, including the chairman of the school management committee, Wuni Guma Francis, who says the East Bamprosi Municipal Assembly, together with the education directorate, has decided to turn a blind eye to the problem. He said the MC and education directorate in the municipality must be held responsible if the facility was allowed to collapse on the peoples. The assembly and the education directorate are much aware of this problem. I have copies of all the appeals sent to them. At this stage, any inconvenience can come, especially as the rains approach. If this building should collapse on the children, who is going to be held responsible? Both the MC and the education director were not available to comment after many unsuccessful attempts. From Nalergo, Ilias Sutanko, reporting for Joy News. And here in the studio, my name is Aisha Ibrahim. Let's take a break. When we return, there's more in business. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Businesses are expected to start paying the growth and sustainability levy by end of June this year. This is despite an announcement by the Ghana Revenue Authority that it will start implementing the three key taxes beginning this month. Here's more. Joy Business understands that this is due to the fact that the growth and sustainability levy, which is a percentage of a company's profit before taxes, will be based on earnings for every quarter this year. That is why the first payment should be made by these companies at the end of June 2023. The tax, which is replacing the National Fiscal Stabilization Levy, seeks to impose a special levy to raise revenue for growth and fiscal sustainability of the economy. The tax is seeking to impose 5% on the profit before tax of banks, other financial institutions, as well as oil marketing companies and telecom operators. Mining and oil extracting firms will pay 1% of their gross production as a levy. All other companies have been asked to pay 2.5% of their profit before tax as a levy. We also understand that the guidelines for all the three key tax measures will be published before the end of this month. This will give fine details on how the payment should be done by these businesses and industries out there. 
government is hoping to raise almost 4 billion Ghana cities from these revised taxes. However, some have argued that looking at the current state of the economy and the time that they are starting to collect these taxes, as well as concerns being expressed by enterprises, some have argued that government may struggle to hit its target. Now, senior finance lecturer at the University of Cape Coast uh, Business School, Siam Kao, is hopeful the newly appointed World Bank President Ajay Bangal will continue the agenda of the Bretton Woods Institution in helping developing countries like Ghana secure rapid debt reprofiling with international creditors. Banga was yesterday uh, elected, selected as the 14th president of the World Bank. Speaking to Joy Business, Mr. Kao said his priority should be to foster economic growth in developing countries through debt forgiveness. He is going to ensure that there is the right thing that is done. The processes that have been set out in terms of the debt sustainability level would also have to go on, meeting the ideals of the external creditors and pushing that to the IMF board will still have to go on. He will not want to come and tell the entire process and jump the whole thing. Uh, you look, if you look at what he has done over time, he is the man who will stand for the right thing to be done mm. and making sure that countries come out of difficulties that they they face from time to time. And so, yes, it's good news. He will want to push for these things to be done, but at the same time, he will ensure that there is the right thing that we do as a country. They have influence in ensuring that all member countries are protected. And so he's going to push that particular agenda, but he is not going to jump the processes that have been set out by the World Bank. He has been part of the World Bank group and he knows what processes they go through. So coming in will not jump that particular process, but he will just make sure that the writing is done by influencing the other countries, talking to them to speed up the negotiations as we uh, waiting for it. Maybe one of the greatest things that we can expect from him is influencing the parish club to set up the creditor committee to mm. facilitate the process for Ghana to get the IMF deal. All right, and that's it for business. More news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. It's back to you, Aisha. Of course, more news is on myjoyonline.com. You'll get all the developing stories and also the updates are over there. That's our wrap-up news desk this morning to enjoy the rest of our programs.